Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. It's April the 7th, 2019. And of course, the title of our broadcast, Global Conflict Serving an Elite Financial Agenda. That sounds pretty, uh, pretty like a wild statement to make there. But I think when you uh, take a look at some of the headlines here that we're looking at and then going into some of the issues that we're going to be facing soon i think it might make more sense it's actually probably even a much bigger uh endeavor than what i can fathom myself uh we already are looking right here on uh in france right now it's just really really going completely out of hand and um we're dealing with both, uh, these are the yellow vest protesters, the right wing and the left wing there. They're now fighting one another uh, in this conflict in France. And uh, in just a moment here, you're going to see them when they really go to head here in this battle. I'll kind of move it forward just a little bit. Uh, they'll keep provoking one another till they just get into an all out brawl. And uh, when they do, of course, one group's bigger than the other. They're going to push the smaller group back. And there they go. A knockdown drag out, slugging it out. And, uh, of course, if you begin to look at uh, the different um, videos that are coming out, it's almost like what's going on in France right now. Uh, of course, there's that closer view of that brawl itself, them fighting one another. It's not even in this case here, the police uh, beating them half to death, but now it's the uh, yellow vest protesters fighting one another. Uh, but they're, they're destroying property, they're destroying private property cars, burning cars, burning motorcycles, uh, destroying buildings, everything you can possibly imagine. Uh, but that's only part of the picture that we're looking at here. This global conflict, this global unrest that we see happening everywhere, and of course not just with the individuals, but we also have the wars themselves. Uh, and by the way, just another article here real quick. This was a journalist's protest against yellow vest attacks on the media. Uh, another issue there going on. But we have wars everywhere. The Jerusalem Post reporting Russia says it tested latest Panzer SM air defense system. Uh, this, of course, no doubt going to be deployed in Syria. Uh, as part of the ongoing Syrian conflict. But then we also have the war over in, um, uh, let me pull up the map here for you real quick, uh, Libya, uh, Tripoli, in fact, being uh, the, the new uh, hot spot right now, battle going on all over again in Libya. Of course, we know General Wesley Clark said that was one of the nations that would, that would be toppled. And wars are just everywhere. And it seems to be that there's no end. We got Venezuelan conflict. We got the Syrian conflict. Libya has been a conflict in the past. The refugee crisis that's been created by all these wars is completely going through the roof. And also the Jerusalem Post as well is reporting about Iran. Uh, Israel is not happy because Iran is... Uh, set to take over the Latkia or part of the Latkia port there uh, and that according to the uh, report here on the Jerusalem Post this is supposed to take place I think on yeah October the 1st it says Iran is inching one step closer to establishing a foothold on Iran's doorstep reportedly planning to lease Syria's main commercial port in Latkia now, they say it's on Israel's doorstep, but in reality, Latkia is nowhere near Israel's doorstep. It's actually about 200 miles away from the country to start with. But what's the difference in Iran getting uh, part of the commercial port in Syria than China running two ports in Israel? In fact, running the ports so deeply involved in Israel that they are dictating to the U.S. military how they can come and port at the port with military ships, how they have to do it with no military hardware on deck of their ships when they port there. And we, from according to the President of the United States, China is becoming one of America's greatest foes, but yet Israel is becoming one of their greatest partners while the U.S. goes by the wayside. And at the same time, while we shell out billions of dollars on an annual basis 
uh, to help fund Israeli military and the uh, uh, Israeli infrastructure. In fact, they talk about, what is it, 38 billion over a 10 year period. The actual number is closer to $60 billion over a 10 year period. In fact, not only are we giving Israel this much uh, aid to the country there, uh, that has been going on for decades now, but we also have to borrow the money at interest rates that are normally funded by wealthy bankers, and you can only imagine who controls those banks. I'm not going to say it. I guess you guys already know it. At a 2% interest rate, which basically is costing us as American taxpayers, we're paying about $7 billion dollars over a 10-year period on this money that we continue to give to Israel in aid. So the bankers and their wealthy uh, sponsors that loan us as Americans all this money to loan to Israel, we have to pay the interest rate on this. Israel is only just getting the benefit of it. And listen, I'm not against helping Israel or any other nation that is in need. But Israel right now is becoming one of the world's leading uh, economic uh, powerhouses and being able to, with all the creations that they've made there, the, the different discoveries, the technology, etc., you'd think Israel could probably fund some of this themselves, especially since we're being stuck with the debt on this and paying interest rates on that debt. So what happened? What is it? $10 million a day basically is what we're having to pay out as American taxpayers? Do you think as Americans we'll ever be able to pay the debt? And what happens when these wealthy bankers decide that, oh, by the way, you have defaulted on your interest rate as your trillions of dollars of debt go up. We're going to default on American, uh, the country as America, and it's going to implode on us. Will anybody ever come back and say, oh, by the way, you gave us all this money before. Let us help you out. No, it's not going to happen. Anyway, though, big business. All these wars that are happening, the war in Syria, the war in Iraq, the war uh, that's about to happen in Iran, the war that's going to happen in Lebanon in the not so distant future, Libya turning into another war zone all over again. In Europe, we have refugees by the millions. We have refugees in America. In fact, we're creating our own refugee problem on our southern border that also has become a mega multi million dollar industry for these private contracting companies. And I'm not going to begin to tell you who owns those. I'll let you just think about it. All right. So let me look at some other things. This is what kind of got me started on this. I saw this article on TASS uh, Russian News there. Lavrov, U.S. occupation of the territory of Syria hinders the solution of the problem of the Rukban camp. The Russian foreign minister also noted that Moscow is in favor of early disbandment of the camp. Now, I realize that Vladimir Putin is working very much in behind the scenes to, some people think that he's actually helping the situation, but the, Russia's got their own agenda, their own national security interest. And of course, they're also making millions and billions of dollars or rubles in this case for the Russian elite that are also controlling their banking system and their multi mega million billion dollar industries and arm sales as well. So Russia's got their own plan. But I will give uh, the foreign minister Lavrov credit. He wants to disband these refugee camps, bring the refugees back home so they can rebuild Syria once again. That would be the smart thing. But there's major opposition to this. Stopping the illegal U.S. occupation of Syrian territory is the easiest way to solve the problem of the Rukban refugee camp they, that he says. This was announced on Sunday by Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. He says, I believe that the simplest and most effective solution would be to stop the illegal occupation of this territory by the United States, he said. We have Russian Jordanian operational headquarters for refugees in Amman, U.S. I hope that they will be more constructive in addressing this very acute problem for Jordan. 
The Russian minister drew attention to that fact, the problem with the stay of Syrian refugees need to encourage them to return to their uh, places of permanent residence is very sensitive for Jordan now. As I understand, it, uh, there are 1.3 million refugees from Syria in the kingdom, he said. This, of course, is very heavy burden that affects the socio-economic situation and this problem should be solved. We have a common opinion that rip, rip, uh, rip, uh, rip, 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 I can't say the word right. Repri forget it. Repatriation, I think, should be voluntary and non-discriminatory. But why is it, though, that the U.S. is not willing to let these refugees go back? Same thing going on over in Europe. In fact, they send scares to the refugees there, saying that when you get to Syria, they're going to try you uh, as criminals for abandoning the country at a time of war. Well, maybe they will. I don't know if they will or not. But uh, I started doing some digging, though. I wanted to see why is it that the U.S. is not letting them out? Well, it's big business. And there's a lot of countries and a lot of wealthy private contractors that are benefiting from these refugee camps. In fact, not only benefiting, but they're exploring ways to make even mega millions more from these refugees that are displaced. And I think in the long run, it's going to serve as a way to contain the masses in a new world order where they can control them in these little tiny mini cities that they're planning on building out of these refugee camps. Right? Another thing that happens as well, notice this right here. There's 50,000 people in the Rukban camp. And out of that, we come up with this. The United Nations said it was delivering food, sanitation, and hygiene supplies, and nutrition and health assistance to 50,000 people in Rukban, an area under rebel control and an operation expected to take three to four days. The Syrian Arab Red Crescent is also taking part of the convoy, which will also involve an emergency vaccination campaign for 10,000 children against measles, polio, and other diseases, a UN statement said. Oh, what do you know? Big Pharma. Big Pharma is making money, and not only making money, but it's got themselves 10,000 new guinea pigs. Get to test the new measles vaccine. You remember that little scare that they brought up here in America just recently? The outbreak of measles down at Disneyland in California. Oh, wow. Such a great scare they brought to the American people. How many, what did they have? 50-something people, I think, one. 51 confirmed cases of the measles. And how many millions of people were visiting Disneyland? As my wife will tell you, measles, mumps. Chicken pox, these are all part of a natural order for children. I had all of those when I was a kid. Helps your body to develop the immune system that you need to be able to fight off more serious illnesses later in life. But oh no, we're going to create an epidemic. And it may not just be the measles. They may have some other kind of vaccine mixed into there. You know, another one of those autism uh, accelerated type vaccines that just really drive the human body into a desperation. So yeah, they're making money from all the medical care that is needed. And there are private contractors that are heavily involved in offering the medical community this, this help because why? They're being funded by all the nations that have to host these people in these countries. Well, it's bigger than that though. See, how private companies are exploiting the refugee crisis for profit. That's an article came out on The Independent, and this was back on uh, Friday the 23rd, October 2015. Across Europe, some of the most vulnerable people are being seen as financial opportunity. And they focus more on the financial gain of the private medical industry that was making money because the government's got to fund all this. So they're making big bucks there. But it, that's not the only place where the big bucks are made. This is where it really comes down here. This is from TakePart.com, a very extensive article. Let me just kind of scroll back up right here. The for-profit refugee camp. The for-profit. Now, oddly enough, when you go through this article, uh, the those that are behind this is from a very interesting architectural group that believes that they can save governments millions of dollars by turning these refugee camps into little mini cities. 
Now I kind of find it interesting in some of the names too that you get in here. Like in this case here, you don't often hear the terms business plan and refugee camp in the same sentence, but Kleinschmidt isn't your ordinary humanitarian worker. Kleinschmidt. You can look it up online for yourself. You can kind of see it's German descent individual there no doubt he's a decent man i'm not saying the guy's not a good guy but he's trying to find ways to resolve and there's no way that the picture on your screen can do it justice for what you can see here i can see it a lot clearer myself this is a refugee camp little mini tents maybe little trailers whatever by the tens of thousands in this refugee camp in this country of jordan but there again instead of just disbanding this camp these guys are working on ways to be able to make this as a pilot project, you might call it. In fact, they have in the same article right here, says uh, here, let me just back up just a little bit. In many ways, Zatari, that's the name of the camp there in, in Amman, Jordan, already has plenty of the trappings of the metropolit metropolis. It has schools, hospitals, mosques. A few paved roads. Refugees have opened hundreds of unlicensed kebab stands, hair salons, and mobile phone kiosks. Much of the local economy is pure pilferage. One quarter of all the camp residents are estimated to, uh, to illegally sell donated food, tents, and other aid. The, reform, uh, the reformer's idea is to regulate all this commerce and add more. The reformer ideas. See, they got reformers that have come into the camps to figure out they can't, in other words, all right, they're being able to manage this stuff on their own, but they got to reform it and add more for the people so they can make in these private industries these multi billions of dollars off these poor refugees. Gets more interesting. The reformers' idea is to regulate all this commerce and add more. Let entrepreneurial types and even big corporations make money meeting people's needs. Well, they're being honest. Let me just highlight that for you, right? Let entrepreneurial groups and, uh, and big corporations make money meeting people's needs. Connect the camp to Jordan's water power, transport, and waste system and make those who can afford it pay for using them. Make Zatari a contributor to the local economy instead of a burden on it. They're trying to make it look like the refugee camps can be a utopia, right? You can call it a camp, a city, whatever, is still a densely populated place full of people with the same needs and aspirations as people everywhere, said Don Weinreich, a partner at Ineod Architects who oversees a joint project with the United Nations and Stanford University to develop ways of designing refugee camps to make them operate more like urban environments. You can plan or not all you want to but when the plans are out of sync with people's desires the desires will win out so they're using the situation there that's going on in these refugee camps and they are planning to make it like refugee camps or some kind of utopia but where businesses can make money off of these people meeting their needs so to speak Basically, because, you know, they realize when these people are displaced, there's a lot of these people coming, they got money. Might be in banks somewhere, but so much, bye-bye to your little account. We're basically creating, what, FEMA camps in different countries. But you know what really gets me is this name here, Don Weinreich. That's another one of those names, I guess, you can figure out where that name comes from, right? All right, uh, hang on, my phone seems to pick up everything I say and wants to make sure that the world knows you know big brother knows exactly what I'm saying so we'll put him on airplane mode so he doesn't get to hear everything I say all right anyway though this company though Eniad maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong Eniad I don't know E-N-N-E-A-D I got curious as I did with all the people mentioned in the article, I began to look up these individuals in here. I want to know. And then I want to know who this any idea is because this guy, Don Weinreich, from this architectural firm working with the United Nations and Stanford University, is looking to designing refugee, refugee camps to make, uh, make them operate more like urban environments. I call it the refugee utopia, right? 
And what is it to do? It's to bring about profits. And you're going to find out in a minute just what kind of profits they are. Well, let's take a look at the company. All right. This is the, uh, these are the people here at INEAD, the partners INEAD, the architectural company. Um, and let me see, get the right page here. All right, this is their main uh, INEAD, no, that's INEAD lab, a little different there. Let me back up here, um, get back to their website there. Here we just go to INEAD itself. How does Architectural engage the public to rescue endangered species and restore natural eco eco uh, ecologies? By the way, they're, they're, the, the man that developed this company, uh, very, very hard to find out his past, very well hidden. A lot of things have been removed. All you find out about is all his architectural achievements, uh, he built the Clinton Foundation, uh, their, their, their library. Uh, he also built uh, a Jewish National Museum uh, in New York. Uh, very well-known man for his work, but very known little about him privately. Uh, but at any rate, though, the, the very name of this architectural company also made me wonder, where did they get this name from? Well, that was very interesting because any odd actually comes from um, from this right here let me just blow this up bigger for you so you can see it I want to make sure you guys can really see it any odd were the nine great uh, Osrian gods that's what any odd is any odd the very name of their company comes from the Egyptian gods that include Atom, Shu, Tufnat, Gib, Nut, uh, Osiris, Osiris, Isis, and Set. Now, I kind of find this interesting because, like I said, if you just kind of look at some of the names, or even the, for example, the uh, the man that actually started the company. Let me see if I can find the information on that. There, here we go, right here, James Stewart uh, Polshek. Uh, he was the uh, the the original company founder they changed that name to INEAD it was actually Polshek architectural firm for many many years uh, and you know the funny thing is you could never find anything about this man's past who his mother or his father were who is uh, who is you know was he married uh, in fact I found one thing on ancestry.com originally that I saw this part about Jewish and then when I went to click on it boom it was gone I'm like well that was weird but then I found this one part here in the Boston Jewish Advocate Wedding Announcements. All the wedding announcements from 1905 to 2007 where they've kept their record of Jewish weddings. This is when I found Mr. Uh, James Pol Pol Polshek uh, and how he had married in Akron, Ohio, where, he, where he's actually from. I do know he's from there. He married Ellen uh, Morgolis at that time. And then we find out that his father is Joseph B. Polshek. So I was able to at least find out a little bit about him and I always wondered why he kind of kept all that hidden about himself or at least why none of this stuff is actually made public about him. But this whole issue though with INEAD really bothered me that, that they named their company after a bunch of Egyptian gods and Atum, that first god right there that they have there, uh, which is the uh, uh, Atum and Uf, uh, Ufa Ra, for, uh, I believe that's their sun god there that they worship. But then I noticed too that them riding this serpent here, and of course it says here about this Atum god that he returns in the latter day, it's believed in some of their beliefs there, that he returns in the latter day as uh, shown right here. Sometimes uh, he also is shown as a serpent, the form which he returns to the end in a creative cycle. All right, that's kind of interesting. Now, some of you guys might not realize what I'm talking about because you haven't seen the message that I delivered there at the Orlando conference. It's over on Patreon. But on that message there, I link four people, the New World Order and the way that New World Order is coming. I speak about how that the Talmudists and the Kabbalists actually believe in what they call the Holy Serpent. And the Holy Serpent is part of the Mashiach, uh, Mashiach era, the, the coming of the Messiah. They believe that there is a Holy Serpent coming. Well, that is an Egyptian ideology is what it is. But this is found amongst Kabbalists, Talmudists. 
In other words, the Jewish people that actually believe in the Talmud as the oral law of Moses, which I don't believe it is, Yeshua spent his campaign when he was here 2,000 years ago debunking the Talmud. Uh, but now I can see why. And there's a lot of rabbis that speak about this. They speak about the Holy Serpent. They also speak about Leviathan. They speak about him being defeated. But they speak about in some writings as well that this serpent in the garden was actually the liberator. I go into all this on that message there on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Israeli News Live. I did a very in-depth broadcast about this on a new world order plan, what you need to be aware of. Well, this is what I'm seeing here. But it's like I said, there's big business in this that's going on, right? Huge business. Now, this is the Polshek uh, partnership, the architect now building new names. This is when he changed the name. Actually, the firm didn't go anywhere. Only the name went away. It's replacement, Inyad, right? After these goddess, gods of Egypt. All right, now, skipping over that, but let me go to this part right here. This is later in that same article where they're talking about transforming these uh, refugee camps. And, and by the way, when you read the article, they're not just talking about refugee camps only in Syria or in Jordan or whatever. They go into the refugee camps on a global basis. In fact, the very man speaking in here for, uh, or there's a couple of guys in here actually speaking on on. Uh, for the actual company there, the Ennead company, they're speaking about even in the case of the Katrina catastrophe in America that they would need to build camps for places like that as well. Uh, I'm sure Venezuela will be in the market in the not so distant future, but here's another reason for the building of the plants, excuse me, the, uh, the cities, these refugee cities that they want to make, these urban utopia, refugee utopias they want to build. Where does the money come from? Talking about, because they're talking up above there, uh, out, the, 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 there are grocery stores, bakeries, beauty parlors, and mobile phone shops. There are a travel agency, a jewelry store, brimming with gold bracelets and necklaces, a perfume shop with plate glass display windows and tiled floors, and at least one sit-down restaurant with a dozen tables. This is all in that huge refugee camp that I just showed you the picture of moments ago, right? He says, where does the money come from? Some people brought savings with them or get money from relatives. Some work for organizations inside the camp or illegally outside it. The World Food Program also gives everyone a weekly food credit. Keep that in mind. Worth about $14. All told, an estimated 2,500 refugees run shops to do about 14 million worth of commerce every month in the camp. All right, now what does he say? Business is good. For Basim Mansour, a 24-year-old Syrian I met who sells washing machines and refrigerators and flat screen TVs in a shop made of two patched together housing trailers. Being in these goods isn't allowed, right? Isn't allowed. So we buy them from smugglers, he explained. Casually, Zatari is only about six miles from the town of Mafrak. It's not hard for industrial locals to provide refugees with illicit goods. All of this trade is unlicensed, unregulated, technically illegal, but it continues to be tolerated. Cities run on commerce, not charity. Perhaps the most important element of the push of Ur Urbanify Zatari is its embrace of private enterprise, harnessing market forces to serve humanitarian goals. This general notion is one that many relief and development organizations are promoting these days. Everyone knows these donors can't be counted on to meet the needs of millions of refugees indefinitely, and the spread of microcredit throughout the developing world has shown the poverty-fighting potential of capitalism when geared to the, uh, geared to the disposed. Mercy Corps, for instance, boats, uh, boasts of unbashedly Silicon Valley ish social ventures team that turns ideas into scalable businesses in emerging markets 
acting like an eternal incum uh, incubation, incubation and acceleration lab. So what are they going to do? They want to profiteer off of these refugees. They can't stand the idea that these refugees are pulling in $14 million worth of commerce in a month in one of these refugee camps. So now they're going to take it from them too. Oh, you'll still be able to get access to the goods and services you want after they design this utopia for you. Basically a concentration camp that they can exploit you with. So it's big business. You know, we had Dr. Pigeon at the, at the conference as well, and I'll be loading up his video this coming week here, and I can probably load his on Israeli News Live. He talked about the, the crooked judicial system that we live in. And one of the things that he brought up as well that made me look for this was the big money that companies make off of prisoners. Welcome to Jail Incorporated, like this article here says on The Guardian, how private companies make money off of U.S. prisons. And medical care is one of the big businesses in these prison systems when they turn them into a private charter. Right? And that's what's happening in America. They have privatized something that the government once used to run, which was far more economical for the government not to privatize it. The only reason they privatize these things is so that somebody else's pockets can get fat as a result. And in fact, Dr. Pigeon was saying that in these companies like this that have these private prisons, those that are making the money with it don't want their prisons empty because they make money based on every individual that's there. So it's big money, millions of dollars. So you have a value in prison and they want the prisons full. That's why they don't care if they throw you in jail or not. That's why this anti-Semitism bill is going to have a 20-year prison sentence. Can you imagine the billions they're going to make off of people that are outspoken, that don't shut their mouth when that time comes? They'll land them in jail with no problem. Even Britain, Britain also, British jihadists trapped in Syria face 10 years behind bars on their return. And yet the British were helping sponsor the jihadists that were fighting in the Syrian war. Why would they want to put their fighters into prison then? Well, it could be that they're not really looking at the jihadists that they were financing, but maybe they fought on the side of the Syrian government. But then again, it could also be the fact that Britain also is ran by what? Private prisons or one of industries not worried about Brexit. So they need people to be put in jail in Britain. So they can't wait for these jihadists to come home because it means more money to the British prisoners uh, or the system that gets the money for privatizing their prisons as well, right? And then we have two, the U.S. U.S.-led coalition says allies in Syria uh, foil Islamic State prison break. There again. That's another big money maker. Even the prisons they have for prisoners that the U.S. runs inside of Syria. Why? Because the taxpayers are paying mega bucks to keep the prisoners in prison there as well. And we don't only have that. We have our border issues here in America. That's actually a good news there I was going to share with you. The Times of Israel found a uh, pottery piece there. I want to thank, I forget the brother's name that sent this to me. We posted it on Israeli News Live there. 2,000-year-old image of a nine-stem menorah found in a rare Jewish site in Beersheba. Uh, there it is right there showing you on your screen there. Nine candle. That shows you the Hasmonean dynasty that overtook the temple and changed it from a seven candle menorah to a nine candle menorah. Hmm. You probably don't know the truth about the miraculous oil that was found that burned for nine days. Look it up in the Talmud, you'll find it there. Anyway, back to the, uh, the issue about what's going on. Uh, I may not have put it there. Oh, by the way, there was our interest that we're paying over 10 years for the amount of money we're giving to, to military aid in Israel. And by the way, all this military things that are going on, even Trump building the wall and the refugee crisis on our border, and I wished I'd have kept those up here as well. I found several of those article as well, articles as well. Do you know that the Trump administration and the Obama administration had a great reason to make sure that they separate the families? 
I know, I know those of you that love Trump, it was Obama that did it, not Trump. Yeah, no, they both did it. You know why? Because private industry is making millions of dollars from aid money that is paid by the taxpayers to keep the refugees incarcerated. The Catholic Church itself makes millions as they get the children. Wow. With their kind of reputation for pedophilia, is that really the place you want the children to go to? No wonder why they make it hard to reunite these families once again. Because of all the mega, mega millions that they make in private industry, these private contractors, for keeping the illegals that come into this nation. You know, things are going to change in the very near future, friends. And don't worry, as they cause more wars, whether it be Venezuela, Libya, once again, creating more of a war, there's going to be more refugees going into Europe. This one new company, Iniad, who has its name after the uh, Egyptian gods there, don't worry, they got for profit the refugee camp, and they're going to push that off to the American public and all the other governments around the world because they're going to save you millions of dollars. They might save some of the governments millions of dollars, but they're going to profiteer off of these refugees. And do you think they want these way, well, the refugees that have money in the banks that they're going to be able to exploit this money from? Do you think they want them to leave these refugee camps? No, just like they don't want them to leave now. Even though Russia is trying to get the refugees back into Syria to rehelp build the country. Now, Russian companies are going to profit very well, too, in the rebuilding of the country. But what Russia wants is Syrian labor force because it's a much cheaper labor force. So, yes, Russia plays a part in this as well. They know the Americans are trying to make money off these refugee camps, but Russia wants to make money off exploiting the labor possibilities that they can get by having the refugees come home to build their country back. And while Russian companies, as well as Chinese companies, all are making multi-millions of dollars of rebuilding the nation while they drain the U.S. taxpayers once again out of their money. But I guess in reality, seeing as the U.S. helped fund this war, we probably should have to pay that off. But you know where the money should come from? These wealthy companies that are backing this desire to do war that Israel under Netanyahu has wanted to do, it should be those companies and those individuals that have promoted the war against Syria, they should be the ones to fund all these projects of reconstruction. Saudi Arabia especially should be funding it as well. I'm Stephen Benoon in a world cycle of never-ending profiteering. War is money. As Murad Gazdiev says on RT, it's big money for America and for the American businessman. But Murad, my good friend, as I would say to you as well, now we see that the refugee camp is a new way of making money on a future plane. I'm Stephen Benin with Israeli News Live, Erev Tov in a world of Ain Shalom. Good morning.